Hunter here, the Vintage Arcade Gal, and it's getting cold. It's turning to fall time here in Seattle, which means the workshop is closed. Uh, and I'm back in school, so I just don't have a lot of time to deal with arcade projects, unfortunately. Ah, uh, higher education, the friends, the academics, the crushing, crushing student debt. But anyway, right before I went back to school, I was able to complete one final project, um, which I'm very happy about. And as you saw in the intro, it's an Atari Cloak and Dagger game. I have been obsessed with ever since I was probably like 10 or 11 when I first saw uh, the original movie. So very, very jazzed to have it in the collection. Plus, it was kind of funny because of doing this project, we ended up with another project accidentally uh, that we'll talk about here. But first, let's talk a little bit about Cloak and Dagger and kind of the history of the game and the history of the movie tie-in. It's pretty interesting. In 1976, Atari struck a deal with media powerhouse Warner Brothers in order to be able to financially support the release of what would eventually become the highly successful Atari 2600 home video game system. This alliance over time would reshape Atari in both good and in bad ways. Perhaps accidentally, however, it did create the first true multimedia company as Atari would go on to become the first true corporate video game powerhouse in the USA. This also brought Atari into the umbrella of other Warner-owned properties from film, television, and even comic books. This mixing of movie and television properties in the early days of video games provided several successes for other companies such as the Disney Bally Midway Tron Enterprise and some interesting failures within Atari such as the infamously panned Atari 2600 cartridge for E.T. which uh, full disclosure I actually really loved as a kid. Atari didn't make its first official arcade movie crossover until May of 1983, when they would release an arcade adaptation of George Lucas' Star Wars film in the arcades. This first-person perspective on-the-rail-style space shooter was a huge success for Atari in an instant arcade classic. Thanks to a combination of a great licensed property, you know, who didn't want to fly an X-Wing fighter after seeing the original Star Wars film the first time, neat wireframe vector graphics, unique controller, and an amazing dedicated cockpit version of the game, and even digital voice samples for the movie, Star Wars would capture the hearts and quarters of arcade video game fans for generations to come. Unfortunately for Atari, they wouldn't piggyback necessarily off the success of Star Wars with their next arcade movie tie-in offering, Firefox. Released in January of 1984, Firefox was based on a Cold War-themed action movie of the same title, starring Clint Eastwood as he attempted to steal a top-secret fighter plane from the USSR, or uh, something. Uh, the movie was a moderate success at the box office at the time, but not so much with critics. Firefox would be Atari's first and only arcade game based on Laserdisc technology to be commercially released, although several other Laserdisc-based games exist as prototypes. The game cost operators at the time $3,799, which in 2021 dollars would be over $10,000 for the upright version, or about $4,300, which would almost be $12,000 today for a fancy cockpit version. The game was ultimately unsuccessful. Only 2,100 total games would be manufactured compared to the 12,000 game cabinets for Star Wars being produced, not just because of the price tag for operators, but disinterest from arcade patrons and for quickly gaining a reputation as being an extremely unreliable game thanks to a particularly dodgy laser disc player model that was installed in the game. Atari would try yet again in the March of 1984 with another movie licensed game, Cloak and Dagger. Unlike the previous movie tie-in titles Star Wars or Firefox, Cloak and Dagger had been in development before the movie tie-in agreement and would become more of a prop in the film rather than an adaptation of the events in the film in video game form. Originally titled Agent X, Cloak and Dagger is a multi-directional shooter designed and programmed by Russell Dahl. Gameplay is like other multi-directional shooters, such as Williams Electronics Robotron 2084, with some interesting differences. In the game, you play Agent X, who is attempting to thwart the evil plans of one 
Dr. Boom in his elaborate underground lair and bomb factory. Each level is full of creatures, lava pets, and a shockingly large number of conveyor belts. Agent X attempts to cross one side of each room to the other, avoiding dangerous items and creatures, along with collecting items such as maps, which become useful in future levels to avoid mines. In the center of each level is a bomb, which acts as sort of a timer to complete each level. A player can use the igniter button to light the bomb early, which in turn speeds up the timer for bonus points upon exiting the level. The game also features fun animations in between each level with a large sprite of Agent X riding on an elevator doing various activities such as playing with a yo-yo or sweating if you had a close call in the previous level. The final level features a boss fight with Dr. Boom himself on floor 32. Although I think it's actually level 33, if you're counting correctly, of his compound. Those defeating Dr. Boom are treated to a very quick look at the top secret plans Agent X has saved from the evil Dr. Boom. Agent X was like many games at Atari in development in a testing phase around 1982 through 83 at the company. During the phase of development in which the game was being prepped for a possible full release, Universal Pictures reached out to Atari about the possibility of creating a video game for their new film in pre-production called, you guessed it, Cloak and Dagger. The film Cloak and Dagger is a Cold War themed spy film based on a Cornell Woolrich story, The Boy Who Cried Murder, which had been adapted to several films previously over the years. The film Cloak and Dagger starts Henry Thomas, as Davy Osborne, who rose to fame playing the lead character Elliot in the film E.T., and longtime Hollywood character actor staple Dabney Coleman in a dual role, both as Henry's overworked single parent provider and as the imaginary spy Jack Flack, or Agent X. Davy's character can be moderately described as an obsessive gamer, deeply involved with the video games and kind of RPG pin and paper style gaming, especially ones based around the Jack Flack character and universe, which is kind of like a fake James Bond kind of character. Davy becomes mixed up accidentally in the smuggling of top secret plans for a stealth bomber when he witnesses a murder and is given an Atari 5200 cartridge of Cloak and Dagger, which by the way, contains a secret microchip with those plans that is activated when a player reaches a certain score playing the game. Good thing Davy had a 5200 and say not in a television, or this would have been a much shorter film. Due to Davy's overactive imagination and also writing his name on a softball he drops at the murder scene, the bad guys find out where he lives and he only has his imaginary friend of Jack Flack to help him when the guns come out and he runs all over San Antonio, Texas, trying to get someone to believe him. Overall, the film is actually a pretty good kitty caper with some decent moments of tension, but it's not exactly Ronin or Heat. The real star of the film might be the transit system of San Antonio since Davy and his friend get freaking all over town quickly thanks to a bus pass. Retro gaming fans tend to love this movie since it's full of vintage Atari gaming goodness and advertising all over the place. Several of the Atari home video game titles and the game shop Davy frequents in the film were never actually released, including ironically Cloak and Dagger, along with home versions of Atari's classic Tempest. It's important and interesting to mention again that Cloak and Dagger is a unique movie tie-in concept for the time period since it isn't based on actual events in the film compared to the Star Wars or Firefox arcade game. Also, it's interesting that Cloak and Dagger was not a film released by Warner Brothers, Atari's parent company. So Warner Brothers really didn't have a stake in the film at all. Universal was interested in using Agent X since it was themed somewhat similarly to the spy themes in the script already, which had been written several years before. Universal Pictures had originally intended to use Nintendo's Donkey Kong as the video game cartridge in the movie, according to early versions of the script. Universal also gives the original title of Cloak and Dagger several shout outs in the film itself. The Jack Flack character explains while hidden in the trunk of the car at one point in the movie that he used to be known as Agent X. Agent X, help! Help me! Get him off me! Is that crowded enough for you in here? Now, over on the arcade front of things business-wise, the industry was starting to move towards selling conversion kits for operators as a cheaper alternative to buying a whole new game for a location. 
Atari started producing conversion kits as well for older titles starting in 1983 with the titles Black Widow and Crystal Castles. Although both of these titles were also released as dedicated machines, it's worth noting, however, that legitimate Black Widow dedicated cabinets here are rather rare, as most are actually conversions. Now, conversion kits show an important shift in the market. Conversion kits allowed operators to switch an unpopular or oh, no longer profitable game title into a new game with the hope of turning that game back into a profitable title. These conversion kits were much less expensive than a whole new game since they used the previous game cabinet and monitor, which the operator already owned. Conversion kits usually contain a new PCB for the game, control panel, artwork, wiring, and whatever else would be needed to change over the game title. Both Black Widow and Crystal Castle's conversion kits were specifically targeted and designed for older Atari game cabinets. Cloak & Dagger, however, was a bit different of a situation and presented a new strategy for Atari's entry into the market of conversion kits. Cloak & Dagger would only be sold officially as a conversion kit. Dedicated units technically do exist housed in the same cabinet style as the dedicated upright Crystal Castles machines, but they were only made for testing and prototyping purposes and never officially offered for sale outside of Atari. Atari wisely marketed Cloak & Dagger as a kit specifically for older titles from rival game manufacturer Williams Electronics. Targeted for cabinets such as Defender, Robotron, Chalice, and Stargate, Atari was able to tap into a rather large pool of possible arcade game cabinet conversion needs since most of the above titles sold very well and by 1983-84 might not have been earning as much money for operators as they had in the past. Kits included specifically dedicated control panels for the machine. The Defender cabinet uses a somewhat different style of overlay and control panel than other Williams titles and was shipped with a different control panel for that version of the kit, a PCB, a PCB cage, a filter board, wiring, side art, a marquee, and instructions. The game PCB uses the previous Williams game power supply and audio amplifier. Specific production numbers of Cloak & Dagger kits from Atari is unfortunately unknown. I would personally estimate as few as 1,200 kits and maybe as many as 2,000 kits were made and distributed. The game is uncommon today, but is sought after by collectors thanks to its rarity and the movie tie-in. Defender cabinet-based conversions to Cloak & Dagger seem much more common than any other Williams cabinet. This could be because Williams made over 60,000 Defender games, and at the time of Cloak & Dagger's release, it would have been the oldest title out of the Williams catalog in which these games were targeted towards. Atari seemed pleased enough with the arcade game to start working on versions for both the Atari 8-bit home computers and for the Atari 5200 game system. Unfortunately, with the market conditions for home video games in 1984 and Atari's eventual economic woes, the home versions would not be completed or ever see the official light of day. Today, only an incomplete prototype for the home computer version has been located by collectors. In the film Cloak & Dagger, even though Davey is seen playing the game on an Atari 5200, the version shown in the film is simply the arcade game ported through a monitor and the product boxes are just mock-ups. By the mid-1980s, Atari was sold off and broken up into two different companies, Atari Corporation and Atari Games. Atari Corporation would focus on home computers mostly, but eventually would get back into home video game systems, while Atari Games would continue to produce arcade games up until about the early 2000s. Atari Games would release several games based on movie properties and television properties over the years, including one based on the 1989 Tim Burton Batman film. Cloak & Dagger is a unique and interesting title, providing some great outside-of-the-box thinking in both gameplay, design, and even marketing. It goes down as the only game the pre-broken up 1984 Atari released solely as a conversion kit. The game also showcases a unique way of attempting to tie in a video game product into a cross-media property without producing an inferior product along the way. It's a shame Cloak & Dagger was released in the year during so many economic roles for Atari and the gaming industry, otherwise it may have found a more widespread success and a home release. 
Although the title today may not be very recognizable outside of hardcore arcade game collectors and enthusiasts, it's a very entertaining and important piece of Atari's history. Now, personally, I've been pretty fascinated with Cloak & Dagger as both a game as a film since I was a kid and first saw it on VHS, probably in the early 80s, and I probably rented it originally from our local Errol's video store. I remember playing the game once, either at an arcade in Ocean City, Maryland, or possibly a local 7-Eleven store, and then never seeing it again. I love the movie as an 11-year-old kid. On a recent rewatching now, I'm 48 years old now, I can't say it holds up spectacularly well, but it's not a terrible movie either. In the arcade game collecting community, the game is well regarded and can be very expensive and difficult to track down in any variation. All right, so here is our, our Cloak and Dagger, uh, which originally would have been a Stargate cabinet. This is the Stargate conversion version of the control panel which is kind of difficult to find. So if you're going to if you desire to make a cloak and dagger out of either a Stargate or a Robotron or a Joust cabinet, finding this control panel, this dedicated control panel, which would have come from Atari in the conversion kit for those games can be kind of hard. I've been looking for one for a while. You can see it's a little yellow um, from cigarette smokes because everyone smoked in the 80s in arcades. Uh, the Wicos are original to the game, but we've replaced the sensors. Still have our original lit up or lighting up uh, LED first player and second player buttons on there. But everything else in the cabinet on the outside is either been refreshed, bondoed, painted, sanded, stripped with new side art and front panel art. Uh, this repo art, which is such fantastic art, uh, was done by this whole game who always does such a great job. And the weird thing about the side art I always find is obviously not originally designed for this cabinet shape at all. It doesn't even go all the way up or to the side. Uh, it was uh, probably originally designed for that Crystal Castle style cabinet. And uh, this is just how it looks, but it's still great looking art. It looks good. And then we have the front kick plate also artwork here, which is super fun. It never came, the kit never came with a bezel art. Um, this is just a clear piece of plexiglass, but I'll probably I'm going to design something in the future, make a custom bezel, kind of like what we did with our Mikey. And then, of course, just the marquee that would have come in every kit for this game. So before we play the game, let's look inside. Actually, I want to show you some things that are done. And also, there's some unique hardware to Cloak & Dagger compared to other Atari titles since this was a conversion kit for Williams Games. Okay, so backdoor and a Williams cabinet game from this era has a rather interesting backdoor arrangement. It's actually a two piece backdoor and these doors are often in terrible condition. You'll soon see why <laughs> we rebuilt this is a brand new top door and the bottom door was able to save, but um, on our Stargate and our remove patrol upstairs, we're actually have built two brand new doors because they're so bloated and so beat up. So what you have to do is you unlock and then this comes off separately and you just put that in your truck or whatever. I don't know. And then that exposes just the monitor. And then to open the back door, there are two clamps there and then it swings open and da -da, we have the PCB and the power supply and the rest of the wiring. So let's take a look in here. I want to show you the uniqueness of this game compared to other Atari titles. All right, so just top to bottom, typical 19 inch Wells Gardner monitor in here, not the original monitor uh, by any means of this game, but it's a good monitor, so we decided to throw the 7000 in here. Below is where things actually get a little more interesting, and I'll show you where I've modded this from the original kit. Now, this is an original Cloak and Dagger PCB. We actually have three sets of these, the two board set with a little interconnect on the other side. Now, if you had bought this originally from Atari and converted it back in the day, it would have come with a cage and one of these RF filter boards that would have gone on the edge and the wiring would have come out of the sides here. But um, I elected not to use this. And instead I have kind of a makeshift JAMA adapter, um, which has three inputs and goes out to, and it looks kind of like a mess, but I, I, I guarantee you it's it's wonderful to <laughs> it out into here. And then we have all the wires that go to the coin mix and the speaker and the controller and whatnot. So um, 
a pretty interesting board set that because uh, as you may or may not know, most Atari boards from this era use their own dedicated power supply as well as an audio regulator board that controls essentially the amplification. Well, since this was designed originally for Williams games, this would have utilized the existing Williams power supply and their audio amplifier slightly modified in order to work. And it came with a little, little doodad extra add-on that helped volume regulation. So it requires a separate amp to get sound. So with that in mind, we had to do a little bit of a, a unique build in here. So if we look down in here, we have our power brick station. This is the same one, the other, a video I posted a, like a week or two ago about how to build one. It's exactly the same kind of design, um, just with a more traditional power supply here um, to provide power to the game. And you're like, well, Cassandra, what the hell is all this stuff? Okay, so now we have two little tiny baby plug here. The plugs in both are power brick for the PCB and the monitor, all that nonsense. And this separate little amplifier here that you see this that's way too powerful for this game, but I'll get to why that is in a minute. Um, this little tiny amp, this little basic two channel amp, you could use to power up a stereo if you wanted to, to receive the feed from the board to power the lone speaker. Now, I had to do this because I had a tiny little kind of amplifier that I built this little $10 kit amp that was specifically designed for these kind of projects. But the problem is that it costs so much interference, no matter how I hooked it up or the power source or the ground system or anything, it would cause interference to the CRT just because of the way I think it was grounded. So I, I bought this for like $20 off of Amazon. It has its own power source, so it's completely clean and there's no interference at all. Um, it has Bluetooth for some reason that we don't need. So this solves the audio issue. It's a overkill of a solution, but it totally works out great. And you can see the bottom here too, I have my, my owner's manual, which I always like to stick in there, um, which is strangely in mint condition. And otherwise we put some new labels in here, some repo labels for what the Williams cabinet would have had. And also below, um, little warning labels in case you'd like to electrocute yourself and need reminders. So, and I, I made the wiring as neat as I could. Um, this is a strangely complicated game to wire into a, a cabinet for the era, but it's as neat back here as I possibly can make it. Uh, I'm kind of a neat freak with this kind of stuff. I like to keep it as organized as possible. And of course, you know, with any of these extra add-ons, you want to make sure that you get everything down. So when you do have to move the game in the future, you last thing you want is this stuff sliding out and damaging this equipment that is uh, kind of hard to repl replicate or replace. So anyway, when we go back up to, you'll see I put, I don't know if you can see this way up here, we have the serial number stickers that I did reproduce up here. And this is indeed uh, number 999, the serial number on the PCB. I think the other two PCBs have lower uh, serial numbers and one has no serial number at all and it's listed as Agent X instead of Cloak and Dagger on the actual board. And I don't think that means it's a prototype or anything. I think that simply means it's just an earlier issue of the PCB kit and eventually it switched over on the silk screen on the PCB to make it Cloak and Dagger, which of course is what it would eventually be called. Okay, so now's the time where we'll briefly play this game to kind of show you, um, in case you've never played Cloak and Dagger before, it's pretty uh, cool. You have your movement controller, up, down, left, right, diagonal, a shooting position, uh, much like, again, like we mentioned, Robotron, and then an igniter button uh, to start the bomb to make it go faster. So it's on free play. And so we get to pick our level, um, but we'll start at the ground level. <laughs> One of the few Atari games that has an intro story scene is we follow Dr. Moon. Get, get our map. Get our little bonus here. And we'll ignite the bomb. Ooh, just barely made it. <laughs> Very exciting. These animations in between the elevator are um, really one of the highlights of this game, I think. Show you 
why you want these little mission plans. Oh, you can't touch the little fur guys. And so on every, essentially, after three levels, you go to a mine level and you've gotten all the little blueprints that will show you where to travel safely. If you travel outside of the area, you'll probably get blown up by a bomb. And there you go, that's Cloak and Dagger. You can also hold these buttons down, the joysticks, and it'll go express right to the mine levels. But you have to remember where the mines are. Um, because now, since I don't have those map pieces, uh, it's a little more intense. Let's see, and then you die, and terrible things happen. So, and like any, any of these games, the, the more you go down the road in these levels, they get harder and much more complicated. And some of the levels are actually fairly interesting in their design and layout. And there is a boss fight at the end which is um, pretty interesting for a game that came out in the early 80s. You don't see that too often. So Cloak and Dagger, super, super interesting game and kind of semi-obscure. So let's take a look at our accidental project that came out because of finishing this game. One of the things I needed to finish the Cloak and Dagger project originally was a CRT 19-inch arcade monitor. I didn't have any extra ones laying around, unfortunately. So I have been searching Facebook, Marketplace, and Craigslist to try to find an inexpensive JAMA game that nobody really wanted that was pretty cheap that I could take the monitor out of to use for the Cloak and Dagger. And I found this, which had been converted into a cabal and has been many, many games over its lifespan. But I had a feeling it had a little bit of a hidden secret, and indeed it did, because when we picked it up and then later after many, many, many afternoons using a uh, stripper, smelling up the neighborhood really nice. It was discovered that it was indeed an Atari Liberator. Now, those of you who have watched my videos in the past or the documentary, I did on Liberator know I'm absolutely obsessed with Liberator. Atari's, one of their biggest flops of a game that they barely made, I only made 762. And this one is, I think one, 141, this is number 141. So we stripped the four layers of paint and sticker off of the side to reveal its original beautiful side art. And so now the game that I originally designed my eyes upon just to use as parts is gonna get restored back into a Liberator because there are just too few Liberators in the world. It's a very, very rare game and a desirable game by collectors. And I have just, even though it does need some work, the cabin has some water damage on the bottom the art was able to be reclaimed and it's just kind of a miracle that after all these years um with all that paint over it the art survived and the cabinet's in pretty decent shape so this is going to be a long-term project we're going to turn it back into a liberator um do i need two liberators no but i don't need lots of things but i have them anyway so we'll see what happens with this once it's finished but this is going to be a long-term project for sure you can see some of the water damage up here but the fact that it still exists and will exist again makes me very, very happy. So a bonus project has come into my life just as I was finishing another one. It's um, just kind of how this hobby works. <laughs> and that is it for this video. This time, I uh, probably won't be making any videos for the next couple months because school is starting up and as the world's oldest college student, I'll be very busy trying to keep up with my fellow kids with work. And, uh, Bo, if you can't get enough of me or whatever, you can always check out my website. You can check out my Instagram. And I made an appearance on a podcast recently, Arcade Repair Tips, that you can listen to that was a lot of fun. But otherwise, that's it for now. And happy hunting, and thanks for watching.